Welcome to Garifuna Music and Talk with DJ La Buga, the home of the classic Garifuna Music. This is a weekly radio show online through www.lmbroots.com in the Bronx, New York and www.radiocentroamerica.com in Los Angeles. We are live every Wednesday from 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. We bring to you a special guest from throughout the diaspora, from musicians, authors, artists, to scholars and newsmakers. So tune in every week for another community acclaimed show. Find us on Facebook, Gafu Norales on Twitter and Garifuna Heritage Foundation on Google Circles and Instagram. Follow me on Facebook as Rony Dick. Welcome to Garifuna Music and Talk with D. We're live, we're live, we're live tonight, ladies and gentlemen. This is Garifuna Music and Talk with DJ Labuga, and we're back, we're back again. And tonight we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Linda Alvarez. She's the assistant professor at the Central American Studies Program, California State University, Northridge, a one of a kind university with the only Central American program in the nation. So she will be coming up in a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to remind you that coming up in May, on the 26th through the 30th, we have the Garifuna International Film Festival. So here is the announcement for the great festival, and I hope that you don't miss it because it's going to be one of the greatest events coming up in 2016. Here we go. You are cordially invited to attend the 5th Annual Garifuna International Indigenous Film Festival. May 26 through the 30th, 2016, Garifuna International Indigenous Film Festival. Location, 1416 Electric Avenue, Venice, California, at the Electric Lodge. Join us in celebrating indigenous cultures at the 5th Annual Garifuna International Film Festival. For more information, visit www.garifunafilmfestival.com Honor, respect indigenous cultures. Join us, celebrating indigenous cultures. All right, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, this will be happening in Los Angeles, rather the West Los Angeles city, wonderful city, um, which is Venice, California, and the, at the beautiful theater known as the Electric Lodge. And this is a festival that is happening for the past four years. So we want to congratulate the promoter, the founder, the couple behind this wonderful event, Ms. Frida Sidorov and her husband, Dr. Sidorov, uh, who are members of the Garifuna community. And of course, Sida herself is a Garifuna from Punta Gorda town in Toledo district in Belize. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget that our Garifuna classes online will be starting next week with one of our kind professor again. He is the presidential commissioner against racism in Guatemala. And he's also the teacher who will be teaching the Garifuna class online beginning next week, Wednesday at 7 p.m. right here through lmbroots.com radio and through www.radiocentroamerica.com. And that is for the Garifuna classes for free, and they are available to anyone and everyone who is interested in learning the language. And if you already speak the language, learn the, the grammar, uh, the numbers, the colors, and so much more that there is to explore about the Garifuna language, the beauty of it. So tonight, it's all about Dr. Linda Alvarez. She is an assistant professor at the Central, Central American Studies Program at California State University, Northridge. So Dr. Alvarez is conducting a research, a project that deals with the existing issues of police violence against communities of color. But I'm gonna let Dr. Alvarez introduce herself. 
and also give us a little uh, background about what we are about to discuss tonight. So welcome, Dr. Alvarez, tonight to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to speak with you all. Um, well, I, uh, as it was explained, I am a professor at the Central Market Studies uh, program at Cal State University Northridge. Um, I am from California, born and raised in Los Angeles, but my parents are Costa Rican, so I definitely um, have the Central American experience. Um, I went back and forth a lot as a child and as a young adult, so actually it's time for me to get back out there again. Um, I do have a, a, my work in general, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I'm a political scientist and mostly I deal with world and comparative politics, but really my research focuses on political behavior, um, things like migration, race, and ethnic politics, uh, and these kinds of things. I'm also very interested in food politics. Um, but I, I wanted to have the opportunity to speak with you all tonight um, related to this research project. Um, many, I, I think we're all familiar at this point with the Black Lives Matter movement that has been taking place here in the U.S. 2012, after the murder of Trayvon Martin, a young man who was, you know, walking down the street uh, by somebody, George Zimmerman, um, and it sparked a lot of outrage because George Zimmerman was essentially acquitted for the death of Tray Trayvon Martin. Um, uh, so once this occurred, um, you know, unfortunately, this is this is not something new that has happened in the United States. The, the U.S. has a historical legacy of violence and oppression toward uh, people of color and specifically towards black communities in the United States. Um, so with this, uh, the founders of this movement created Black Lives Matter as a way of um, asserting that voice and saying, you know, enough is enough. Uh, the police violence against black communities, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. Um, and then, you know, we had more unfortunate uh, events such as the murder of Michael Brown, which incur occurred in Ferguson, um, for which the officer, you know, allegedly responsible for his murder was also acquitted. Um, and then we, again, you know, a couple months later, you know, you see Eric Gardner, the murder, the death of Eric Gardner, you see the murder of Tamir Rice, you see Freddie Gray, Sandra Blanza, the, the list goes on and on, right? And so there was a significant outcry here in the U.S., um, and, and I'm sure many have seen and heard the marches and the protests across the United States with um, the hashtag Black, Black Lives Matter, and this even extended throughout the world, where people all over the world were, were hashtagging and really uh, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and really, I wanted to I want to make clear um, that the, the Black Lives Matter movement is not just about police violence, it's very significantly about that, but uh, not just about the violence toward black communities by um, police, but also wants to address this issue of powerlessness that, of the black community at the hands of the state. And um, if I can use the words of the founders themselves, um, they say that Black Lives Matter is an affirmation of black folks' contribution to this society our humanity and to make salient the resilience of black people in the face of deadly oppression. So I think this is definitely uh, a very important movement and one that is absolutely necessary um, in, in our society as it, as it stands now. Um, so once the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement took root, we became very popular, um, like other movements, it faced certain challenges, and primarily, I think this was in the form of uh, what can be called some efforts to usurp the movement. Um, people were mobilizing to say, yes, black lives matter, but also other lives matter, or it's not about black lives specifically, uh, it's all about all lives matter, not just black lives. Um, so this kind of started to create some some challenges for the movement in terms of how to respond to this. And um, I think, again, the founders responded um, very appropriately with with the idea that, uh, again, to use their own words, when black people get free, everyone gets free, right? So since state violence really affects black lives, 
um, the movement is based on the understanding that when black people get free, essentially that all of society benefits from this. Um, but along with this kind of challenge of Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, was also uh, conversations about what about other communities of color, like Latinos. So do we say Brown Lives Matter? Um, where do the Latinos fit into the community? Um, so these kinds of challenges were, were coming up in relation to the movement. And uh, that's where it really got me to thinking about kind of the complexities around race in Latin America and Centro America and and the way we think about race and the way we live race and experience race is often very different than the way it occurs here in the U.S. In the U.S. it's often a very black-white dimension. Um, in Latin America it's very different where you have uh, race, ethnicity, class plays a role. All these things kind of play into the racial formation, racial identity formation, ethnic formation, and um, these kinds of things. And so I, I thought um, it was kind of very interesting to look at how this this notion of Black Lives Matter and um, kind of like a rebirth of a Black liberation movement. How is it affecting um, Afro Latinos? Right. right, and right. and specifically, I wanted to look at the Garifuna community because um, it, the Garifuna community not only identifies as in a racial way, right, as black, but also uh, ethnically as indigenous. And so there's there's certain dimensions to the identity process among Garifuna. So um, research is more of uh, exploratory, where I really want to hear from the community itself, where they. Um, may fit into um, this notion of Black Lives Matter? Do they feel represented by the movement? Um, does the movement speak to issues that affect the Garifuna community on a daily basis? Um, has this even been the experience of the Garifuna community? And also um, ask other questions related to how um, racial and ethnic identity is conceived of by Garifuna who live here in the U.S. So these are these are some of the ways, um, some of the questions I have uh, in terms of this study, and these are the things I'm trying to understand. Wow, excellent, very nice, uh, Dr. Alvarez. Um, we're very excited that uh, you accepted our invitation to be on our uh, weekly radio show. Um, it is important to know the the way the Garifuna community uh, sees this Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Based on experience and and with uh, you know talking to uh, a lot of people in the community in regards to uh, violence uh, from the police towards black people, um, of course Garifuna do not identify as African American. However, mm -hmm. when it comes to color, hey, everybody looks black. You know they are going to be the victims of, of violence sooner or later. Or they have right. in New York, for example, there was a case where. Um, a gentleman by the name of Fermin Arzu, he was Honduran Garifuna, living in the Bronx. He was driving, um, supposedly, allegedly under the influence, uh, on, a, on a car driving uh, back home. And as he drove through a neighborhood, he um, apparently hit another car, and an off-duty LAPD officer came out of his apartment and shot him and killed them oh. right then and there. And so that was a big, big um, wake up for the community. Uh, the protests started to happen in the community. Even uh, uh, Al Sharpton came to, to the Bronx and marched right along with the Garifuna community and the leaders to protest against uh, the abuse by this police officer who was off duty, who did not have to shoot uh, to kill. So... Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, and eventually he got acquitted. Um, I, I don't even remember exactly what happened, what the end result was, but it was something that did not make the community very happy. So, therefore, we have um, later on, later on, we're going to get uh, a phone call from Jerry Castro, who is a community activist who was very well involved in this uh, issue uh, of the killing of Mr. Fermin Arzu in the Bronx. Also, uh, Joey Nance, uh, uh, doctor, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Alvarez, we're going to have a little bit later, 
one of the Garifuna lawyers who is into immigration. Her name is Sharon Williams. She will be joining us a little bit later in this conversation. As soon as she gets off from work, she's going to call us and interact with you and, of course, the audience to discuss this issue of Black Lives Matter and how the Garifuna community sees, sees it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alvarez, for being with us tonight. And um, so I understand uh, that uh, this research that you have been conducting, um, it started in the African-American communities in Missouri. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, along with one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ivy Cargyle, we... Um, we're interested in this notion of violence um, and, and threats against communities of color. So actually, we started working on a project that looked at uh, migrant communities, mostly Latino communities in Tucson, Arizona, mm -hmm. and also the um, African-American community in Ferguson, Missouri. And this was a year after the Mike, Michael Brown incident had occurred. Um, and really... What we wanted to know is, um, you know, the the our communities, the the black and the brown communities, are becoming, um, you know, these are it's what's now called the a majority uh, minority majority, right? These are large communities, and so political scientists get very interested in the way um, how will these communities participate in politics, and what you know, what way will they lean, will they vote, and all these kinds of things. Um, but one of the very interesting things to look at is that um, so so much of what the communities experience at times and what we see with things like the Black Lives Matter movement is threat on behalf of the state, right? Mm. So in Arizona, perhaps it would have been um, the police also, but also immigration and border patrol that's always around. And so there's this constant threat uh, in this uh, in in Ferguson, Missouri, when we went there, you know, one of the very striking, um, you know, and just very. Uh, doctor, give I, me, I don't even. Give me one second, doctor. Let me take this call. I think that's uh, Sharon. Hold on. Sure, sure. I had a hard time trying to figure this out right here. Uh, conference call. So we have now on the line Mr. Jerry Castro, who is an activist in the Garifuna community, and of course, Doctor Linda Alvarez. Um, who is um, um, an assistant professor at Cal State University in Northridge through the Central American Studies. Uh, so welcome, Jerry, tonight. How are you? Ida Binya. Everything is well, thanks, and uh, greetings for everybody uh, who is listening to DJ La Boga. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry, for that. LMB. And did you get a chance to um, listen in on what uh, Dr. Alvarez was expanding on as far as Black Lives Matter? I, I just literally walked into the uh, to my station now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I apologize for being late. No problem. Uh, uh, Jerry, we were talking about the the killing of Mr. Fermin Arsu in the Bronx. Can you elaborate a little bit about that, and then we'll get back to Dr. Alvarez so we could actually retake the conversation, and maybe uh, Dr. Alvarez could, you know, ask you some of the questions in, in relationship and as far as Black Lives Matter, matter and how the Garifuna community sees it. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so the incident with the late Fermin Arzul happened in May of 2007. Um, uh, he was... Uh, killed by an off-duty police officer uh, after dropping off his wife uh, from a, um, uh, a doctor a hospital visit, as far as, far as, far as, far as I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were many reports. Uh, no one really know what led to the uh, to the eventual fatal shooting of the uh, of the young man. Um, but clearly, uh, when uh, uh, I mean, the guy, you know, literally passed passed away and all that good stuff. Uh, what that led to uh, was to um, organize members of the uh, of, of my community in in the Bronx, New York, uh, by bringing together a coalition of uh, community.
community organizations, um, uh, civil rights organizations, uh, uh, clergy organizations uh, who wanted to bring justice on this. Um, uh, it was, um, and also to have a conversation with the police. Uh, there's been many instances where members of the Arab and the community, particularly in the Bronx, had been um, harassed um, by the local precincts and stuff. Uh, and this was part of the culmination to uh, what pe what brought people outside to showcase not not only their um, their frustrations, but also to figure out ways on how to address these issues related to the police, to which is nine times out of ten still going on today uh, mm -hmm. within the Bronx. Did you get a chance to hear that, uh, Dr. Alvarez? Yes. I'm sorry, did you say, did I hear that? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, perfectly. So that's a clear example right there, uh, Dr. Alvarez, of, of, uh, of course, Black Lives Matter. Uh, it was very early on, even before the birth of this movement, of course, uh, because we're talking about the mid nine, no, not even the mid 90s. I would, I would, I would say probably about, uh, early 2000, uh, Jerry? It, it, it was uh, sort of like mid, late 2000. It happened on May, May 15th, I believe, May 15th or May 18th, uh, 2007. Um, uh, right on 161st Street by, um, oh my goodness, um, uh, uh, by Prospect Avenue, sorry, by Wapoto as, as it's famously known among the community and all that good stuff. It, it didn't happen at Wapoto, but it happened by, on, uh, by the, um, uh, number two and number five line, uh, Prospect Station. Wow, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Uh, wow. Now, Dr. Alvarez, you mentioned that there is uh, no research that explores the ways in which Afro-Latino communities are dealing with the issue of police violence against primary black communities in the United States and how these communities are managing the issues of race that are emerging more and more in this current uh, U.S. context. Yes, I mean, there's... I would say that there's some research is limited though. Um, so when generally uh, when you look at issues of race or when the academic community looks at issues of race, there, there's a tendency to focus on the larger groups. So they'll focus on Mexican, the Mexican population or Puerto Rican or Dominican. Um, and then, you know, more recently, at least on the West Coast here, there's like the Salvadorian population. Um, but there's not much of a focus ever on um, Afro-Latino communities and the differences that exist here and the differences in um, experiences and perceptions of race and ethnicity as well. So uh, it's, it's something that we really have to do a better job of at really exploring and, and getting the community voice um, to be heard on these issues, right? Um, the... the, the what is classified as Latino here in the U.S. is actually a very, very diverse group. Um, yep. So to say Latinos think this, you know, the, the logical question is, well, what, what Latinos? Or, what, <laughs> you know, what group are you talking about and who specifically? And that's not to say that we necessarily exist as a very divided community, but there are differences in our experiences that, that really need to be paid importance to and need to be heard in this larger conversation about things like Black Lives Matter, things like race, things like ethnicity, and the experiences of that, I think, are is very important. Yes. Jerry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that was right on point, uh, even though uh, it, it, it's a phenomenon that's been going on um, over the years, uh, but it's coming out, it's been coming out to light, uh, uh, particularly um, right after, um, I wouldn't even say right after the 2000s, because I remember in St. Mary's Park, uh, where we couldn't have events out there simply because we were playing music, right? This is in the Bronx. Uh, mm -hmm. Being new immigrants, yes. Uh, being new immigrants or coming out as new immigrants in a predominantly, um, I guess, uh, uh, inner city neighborhood, uh, was tough. Not saying that all of the experiences were bad, but particularly in St. Mary's Park, 
uh, between 1992-1993 uh, with old men sitting down to play dominoes and playing a little bit of punta, you know, cops mm-hmm. would come over and, you know, order them to shut it down and uh, use the issues of permits and all that good stuff. Uh, eventually, people got organized and, you know, that's when folks started to come out and literally made St. Mary's Park uh, a an area to sort of like uh, go ahead and you know bring your families and all that good stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess the community is dealing with the matter was if one individual or a couple of individuals were to be approached, um, past response has been let us all go together and stuff and showcase that you know what the culture is all about is about family and community, not about these perceptions and all that stuff. And various examples could be in like from Trujillano Park, right on right on 170th and Southern Boulevard, mm-hmm. Fontana Park, and Cortland Park, St. Mary's Park, and, Bo- and Borrachito Park, just to name a few. Wow. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Alvarez, I think you need to take a trip to uh, the Bronx, where you're going to yeah. find one of the largest yeah. Garifuna communities outside of Central America. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I need to yeah. book my ticket and head over. <laughs> yeah, in, in, so, indeed. I mean, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to hear a lot. And, and yes, all of these have been happening um, around uh, over the years. But, um, um, uh, again, a way to deal with it. Um, normally, the community looks at it as a challenge, an opportunity, and begin to work around it. Um, mm-hmm. um, another issue could be when folks were, um, you know, selling food, um, something that they had been doing for quite some time, a long time, all like this stuff, um, and you will see the type of harassment that comes through and all that good stuff. Um, right. However, it started to change or began to change um, in and about the, the, the 90s uh, with the um, beginning of uh, El Desfile uh, Centroamericano, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I believe in 1998, 1999, um, uh, you know, that's when it started sort of like uh, to begin to change, um, begin to change the perspective of, you know, law enforcement towards this uh, relatively brand new emerging immigrant community, black immigrant community uh, mm-hmm. in the Bronx, which from then until now, it has grown. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it happens. I'm sure it's still happening. I mean, those were just perfect examples. Uh, you have, um, uh, I believe Ferry Point went through it as well uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which is partially owned by Mr. Donald Trump today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> FYI. Um, Uh-oh. But, yeah, I mean, those things have been happening over the years and all that good stuff. And it's, and it's an issue that's going on in the community. There are several activists within the community who have been – Voicing, voicing concerns about this issue, looking at ways on how to make sure that, you know what, um, um, you know, um, empower folks about what the culture is all about and all that stuff. Uh, but um, nine times out of ten, uh, not only more research is needed to address this matter, but more resources available to the community as well. And I think that's where everybody stuck. Good point, Jerry. Right. Good point. So, yeah. Dr. Alvarez, how can we help you? I mean, we have Jerry. Jerry is well connected with the Garifuna community up and down the United States, the, the continental U.S. Um, he travels a lot. He is well versed in, in all things Garifuna. Um, so, can you explain to Jerry what you are doing and what you are hoping to accomplish and maybe um, address some of the questions that you want to um, um you know, address to the community, uh, but maybe Jerry could give you guidance and, and, and point you to the, in the right direction. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying here. I think that you're, the point, Jerry, that you're making about uh, res- resources for the community is very important because, um, you know, oftentimes one of the I would say sins of academia is that they go, you know, researchers will go in, do a study, and then they take it back somewhere and nobody ever sees right. it in the community again. You don't <laughs> see it, you don't read it, you don't know, you just know somebody came and asked a bunch of questions and then left. 
Um, so a very important piece in having the voice of the community participation in research is to be able to give it give it back, right, and say, here's first of all, here's what we found. If you guys want to check it out, it's available to you. But also to provide that there's some purpose to it beyond just, you know, being stuck in some journal somewhere, um, but that it provides something for the community. So, um, and, you know, this is something that, uh, um, that, Ronnie, we were talking a little bit earlier about the research that was going on in Ferguson and Missouri was that a, a lot of members of the community, once there was all this violence going on in Ferguson and, and the police violence and all these things, um, really the, the movement there was active in even very basic things like here's a little card that you can that you can have on you if you get stopped by the police these these are the things that are your absolute right right or here's some examples of what you can say um, or what you should say if the police just start harassing or things like that and so it went from small individual things like that to kind of more large scale even at the policy level of what could be done mm-hmm. Um, to protect communities and to, you know, really decrease this, again, historical legacy of, in the U.S. of violence towards uh, communities of color. Um, with this study specifically, really, at, uh, at its most basic level, I just want to hear from the community. I would like to know, um, you know, in terms of something like Black Lives Matter, um, I, do, I don't want to take the position of assuming that everybody feels the same way about everything. Um, and so right. with, with, with a very strong movement like this, Black Lives Matter, um, it, in speaking with members of um, the Latino community and a few members of the Garifuna community, you know, I've heard different perspectives about, um, you know, we, we, the lives may be different, right? The experiences may be different. Um, and other people feel that it's very connected, that, yeah, because... The U.S. is very black, white, you know, and I mean that liter- literally and figuratively in terms of race, then um, it doesn't matter if you identify as Garifuna, if you identify as Latino, if you identify whatever, it, it literally comes down to what the census makes us do, right, which is what is your race? Pick one. And so you're either black or you're white. Um, right. And that's it. There's no in between. So... Um, in this context, you know, with the Garifuna have such a rich history and, and in C- Central America there's such a, um, has been such a powerful movement there to really assert both racial and ethnic identities there and, um, and, and you know, these movements are obviously very much alive and, and huge and strong in, in Central America then what is it like here in the U.S. Um, having to identify as a specific race uh, do, do people overlook the ethnicity factor? And do things like this Black Lives Matter movement actually resonate, I would say, with, with the community? Do you feel like the Black Lives Matter movement encompasses your experience? Do you feel like this movement represents you as a, you know, in whatever way you choose to identify, be it Afro-Latino, Garifuna, uh, Latino, right, any of these categories, um, it, does it represent you essentially? And and you know, I I, I was speaking with someone also who said um, that some members of the Garifuna community uh, may have come here a long time ago and were very aligned with even the civil rights movement. And then um, as time went on, uh, maybe as their kids have grown up here, then there's a little bit of detachment from that, and there's also a little bit of detachment from. Um, the Garifuna culture and community uh, is, is Black Lives Matter kind of you know the second wave of this you know if your parents were involved in the civil rights movement or, or at least sympathetic to it are Garifuna youth um, kind of attracted to Black Lives Matter or does or not at all it could be that you know maybe there is no resonance and if that's the case then you know why or, or what would make um, these kinds of things, um, something that that does involve the community. So, so those are kinds of some of the questions that that I'm really trying to understand right. and look at, as well as just thoughts about uh, race, right? Mm-hmm. Like this issue of race and um, and ethnicity as as members of the Garifuna community who are here in in the U.S. 
Uh, clearly, right? Uh, you're hitting mm-hmm. you're hitting on on key important things uh, in regards to this issue. Yes, um, many of us have been sort of like victims of the famously um, a policy put back in uh, in New York, known as stop and frisk. Uh, mm-hmm. which was detrimental to not only Garifuna folks or Garifuna youth, but people in color, color as a whole throughout uh, the city of New York. Uh, regardless of whether you are Garifuna, whether you are Haitian, whether you are African, or, or uh, sometimes uh, urban Caucasian, uh, nine times out of ten, because of that perception, uh, you would be stopped, you would be questioned, um, unconstitutionally and all that good stuff. So yes, um, and I think uh, if you were to ask folks uh, about their experiences, then we'll stop and frisk. And how does that relate to the Black Lives Matter now? I think it's a, uh, many will say it's a continuation, right? Mm-hmm. To seeking a solution to improve uh, community policing in urban neighborhoods and all that good stuff, particularly in the city, in the city of New York, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what is the process, right? Uh, back right. in the day, prior to all of this, uh, there used to be, going back to the earlier discussion on uh, resources, uh, there used to be PAL, uh, uh, Police Athletic League uh, programs available for a lot of folks. Um, there used to be uh, after-school programs available for a lot of folks. Uh, not to say that it shouldn't happen now, I think the benefit and that it can happen right now, and I think I'm jumping into solutions, right, um, will be to sort of like have people like James Lavelle, um, you know, conduct classes or programs in culture and all that good stuff. Um, even though that there have been plenty of uh, instances and, and experiences among uh, our community and police departments, there have been an increase of uh, young Garifuna getting involved in law enforcement. Uh, particularly, I believe there's a man in California who is the chief of police um, as of now in California, I believe. Uh, Frida's brother, I believe, right? Yes, Frida. Um, so there, Frida so there, Yeah. Yeah. So there's that balance, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, perhaps utilizing those um, figures on um, having that, having that um, direct uh, contact cultural contact with someone within the department could pretty much lead into, um, you know, finding uh, or or tackling solutions culturally right away and all that stuff. You know, in, in regards to grandparents participating in, in civil rights, um, I would, I, I guess everyone will agree that each and every, uh, each and every one of our grandparents have been involved in an ongoing civil rights of Garifuna identity, heritage, right. and pride, whether here in the United States, uh, but most importantly, back in Central America, uh, to which right. that's where the biggest fight for Garifuna civil rights is taking place. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you would eventually, I mean, you have some folks in, in LA, I believe, uh, Mr. Palacio could be one. Uh, I know I met a guy in, uh, an old guy, a young guy, a, a, a man uh, who was uh, who marched in, I uh, believe Selma. He had mentioned uh, in Houston uh, in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen sixties, I believe. Um, he had mentioned. Uh, I don't know whether the guy is still alive today, uh, but he was one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, members of the senior community who would go to uh, uh, to the Hillcroft mayor's office uh, to get breakfast uh, every day at 9 a.m. Uh, uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, so I can relate to that one experience where he would talk about how, as a young man, when he came from Honduras, uh, he saw this movement going on and he had no other option but to join it because he was one of the merchant marines who was stationed in New Orleans, in Biloxi, as a matter of fact, Biloxi, Mississippi, right? Uh, so that, that's one. Uh, that's one example and stuff um, that I can uh, point to. Uh, 
Um, but, you know, you will eventually come across many experiences when it comes to families getting involved um, in civil rights, uh, whether it was the Amado Diallo in 1999, was it? Uh, Abner Luima, uh, all of these instances, uh, Vasquez in the Bronx, I mean, uh, it keeps going and going. Uh, but yeah, you, yeah, but I guess to answer your question, yes, there is that, uh, relationship. Uh, there is that identity, uh, when mm-hmm. it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, not only between the Caribbean community, but many other, uh, different ethnic, ethnic groups as well. Wow, very nice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Garifuna Music on top with DJ Labuga. We're live through www.lmbroots.com radio in the Boogie Down Bronx and through www.radiocentramerica.com in downtown Los Angeles. So we are live through two radio stations and I want to thank uh, our listeners who are tuning in and uh, who are sending their comments. Um, in time due, we are going to read your comments and, of course, uh, make it available uh, for Dr. Alvarez. Um, I want to send a shout out to Jamila Rain, who is from Belize, who has a very personal issues to share in regards to yeah. Black Lives Matter. And, of course, uh, Ms. Renee Nunez, who is listening in uh, Southern California as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, we shall continue tonight. And uh, let me also mention that um, Jerry Castro is a community activist. He's a Garifuna from Livingston, Isabel, Guatemala, uh, born and raised in, I mean, born in Guatemala, raised in the Bronx, and of course he is now um, uh, traveling all over the United States, uh, getting involved in politics and doing the things that he likes to do best. And of course, <laughs> our special guest tonight is Dr. Alvarez, Linda Alvarez, who is a, an assistant professor at Cal State University Northridge Central American Studies Program. And of course, uh, we are so glad to have you here tonight, uh, Dr. Alvarez, and we are discussing the issue of Black Lives Matter. Yes, doctor. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so thank you uh, for that for that information, Jerry. I think it's um, very important to you know look into all of all of these things. I wondered if you could um, elaborate a little bit on your thoughts on um, what what you think about this. Um, idea of the African American experience. Do you uh, feel as Garifuna connected in any way, uh, in some ways, not at all, um, to the African American experience here? And a lot of what is um, fueling kind of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that the Black Lives Matter movement is is about inclusivity across the board of just Black people. I don't think that they mean um, it to be very exclusive to only the African American experience, but I wondered uh, what your thoughts were on on things like that in terms of um, Afro Latino communities and their connection to the African American experience. Uh, yes, I mean uh, when it comes to uh, social justice and civil rights and um, you know uh, pride and identity, each and every one of us clearly identifies with with, with the African American community. Particularly because, you know, when most of us migrate from uh, our towns in Central America, where you're going to find uh, a, a good large majority of population of Garifunas, you're going to find them in inner cities like uh, New Orleans East, uh, um, uh, Harlem, uh, you know, South Bronx, uh, yeah, the south side of Chicago, um, uh, uh, Spokane, uh, uh, Washington, uh, that's where you're going to find some of the guys in the military. Seattle, Washington, where you're going to find a lot of the folks uh, who are merchant marines. Um, Fifth Ward in Houston, uh, which is a historical uh, African-American community. That's where you have perhaps um, one of the largest Garifuna populations in the Gulf Coast, next to New Orleans. Uh, and mm-hmm. And, you know, when Katrina happened in 2005, um, a lot of the people affected were 
uh, people of African descent, African Americans, correct? Uh, minorities mm-hmm. who were economically disadvantaged. Among that group, there was a good number of Garifunas who were affected as well uh, and ended up moving to Houston, Texas, to which they found a second home, and now is their first home as well. Uh, so, yeah, clearly when it comes to um, issues rela- related to uh, um, justice, rights, and identity, um, we participate in uh, being an inclusive uh, ethnic group, uh, uh, keeping in mind that, yes, we also have our our identity as well, uh, and also to highlight what Garifuna as a whole uh, has contributed to the overall African American experience uh, throughout mm-hmm. the year, uh, starting with uh, the drama of King Shuttleway, right? Uh, the first mm-hmm. African American theater play that was put out in 1821 by a uh, West Indian from St. Vincent's name. Um, Oh my God! Uh, what was the guy's name, Ronnie? Wow! Uh, um, William Henry Brown. Yes. Um, <laughs> wow! Good memory. Yeah, William Henry Brown. Uh, while each and everybody was being um, um, minimized mm-hmm. or reduced to just acting parts, uh, what he did on in in what's known today as uh, as Lower Manhattan was to gather a group of actors and the first story that he put out was the story about a Garifuna who uh, repeatedly defeated the British on the island of St. Vincent's. Uh, mm-hmm. When we look at that day, that opened up the doors for not only folks of color, but literally everyone inclusively to lead on to deal with uh, cinema and music. And it was particularly theater and cinema and stuff. So mm-hmm. even though, yes, that we are uh, involved with a lot of um, movements uh, to ensure that there are um, uh, rights are being preserved. We're also uh, also pushing part of the story uh, on this side of the Atlantic that has not been sort of like seen the light, and uh, such as the drama of King Chateauay, uh, which opened up the door. Uh, to not only African Americans, but also paved the way to Asian Americans, uh, Latino Americans. Uh, 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 I mean, we can go on and on and on. There would not be a Denzel Washington today if it wasn't for a guy named James Hewlett who played the role of uh, King Shattaway in 1821. Uh, so when we put that all together, yes, we're all in one because, well, one started it and did the hard was hard work. I mean, we can see the uh, um, uh, the, the the results today, and still going uh, as we move on. There's a comment um, that uh, one of our listeners in the East Coast has posted. Um, listen to this. He said, "She says, I have a different perspective simply because I view the issues confronting Black people in America as something." that precipitated from slavery and segregation in America. Of course, black lives matter, but it transcends the current issue that has precipitated this campaign. I feel there is a unique significance to us as Garinago, which has some serious immigration implications, and that was a comment uh, from one of the listeners in the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Mm And, 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 and I'm an organizer. I have been an organizer since since my days at Booker T. Washington Junior High School in 1991, organizing the group known as the Gulu Gulu when we were being bullied for being Garina mm. uh, But that didn't stop us from creating coalitions with other groups to stop this bullying, right? right. Um, mm-hmm. My perspective of being of the Black Lives Matter movement is that it's addressing a specific issue that normally we rub, we rub, we put under the rug, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, issues of law enforcement towards communities of color. Yes, plenty of immigrants have gone through similar uh, situations. We can count the stories. We can go through the names and stuff. But until
feel this movement has been picking up steam over the years, especially now um, after the uh, the young man who was uh, uh, killed in uh, in Florida, uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. When that kicked off, um, you know, you know, even though the man was not uh, a police officer, but he certainly I see himself as a uh, as a community watchman. Um, and then leading on to the issue, and um, uh, oh my God, why am I having a, a blackout moment? Uh, in Ferguson, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, once that happened, uh, it's it sort of like uh, it, it had reached a boiling point where it didn't matter uh, which uh, part of black do you represent, but it had reached the boiling point because. Everyone has had that experience, and I and I have to say that I went to Ferguson um, during the time when um, uh, the funeral was taking place. And as, as you may recall, Ronnie, I took a video and mm -hmm. interview a couple of folks um, in the uh, adjacent to the apartment complex and just retelling a story about what happened and all that good stuff. And when that guy was telling the story, uh, I. You know, sort of like went into the mindset of, you know, yeah, this has happened in the Bronx to, uh, fellas that I've known. You know what I mean? Um, not particularly, uh, Garifunas, but, you know, friends who simply because you're walking with your baggy pants and, you know, mm. you have a swagger, you automatically have that perception. And those are the things that we have to watch, uh, for because many of us today are parents and, you know, our kids are out there and stuff and, just like uh, police have not changed tactics uh, from the civil rights movement, it's not, it, it's, it hasn't changed right now. And what's sort of like moving the conversation is people from all backgrounds coming together and saying, listen, stop. This is the way, you know, it has to stop because it's been going on for too long. Um, and, uh, you know, this is not the way to go ahead and do things and stuff. Um, but, yeah, that's my outlook on that. But just to go back to, to your to your question, um, when it comes to the to the uh, to what makes there's one thing that makes us unite and that is the issue of uh, community policing because each and everybody has to go through it and all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I mean I think that's an important point. Um, which I, I was talking about this research that we have been doing in both Arizona and in in Ferguson, which are two threatened communities, right? In Arizona, you have the issue of police and border border patrol and all these things with uh, yep. Latino communities. In Ferguson, you have the issue of the police violence. Um, and a, a lot of these things kind of uh, bring up some of the complexities because um, there is the issue of immigration, right? It, it, even in Ferguson, uh, when all this was going down with the police issue, uh, we were there speaking with some of the activists um, and members of the community, and they were saying, you know, that we feel that this is very much an issue for black people in Ferguson. This is something we've been dealing with for a very long time. Uh, right. And and the amount of stress in, in the community is immense. Um, you know, even speaking to some of the members of the community, they would break down and cry. As mothers, they would say, I just I feel every day that my child leaves the house, I just, I'm worried the entire day because I don't know yep. if my son is going to come back. I don't know if he's going to be mistaken for, um, somebody who did something, right? And, yep. and Ferguson has a historical also issue with targeting the black community where, you know, they will stop you four times in, you know, 20 minutes for, you know, traffic infractions and things like that. Uh -huh. Um, but, but one of the things that was interesting is that uh, a couple of the members of the community were saying that, you know, we're dealing with this, but also um, the immigrant community here is dealing with this. And to some extent, they felt that it was worse because at least they said they were saying, at least we speak the language. And so we speak English. And so we can kind of defend ourselves or to some extent, but sometimes the police will not only take advantage of the fact that, you know, you're dealing with 
communities of color, but they also take advantage of the legal status, they'll take advantage of the language, they'll take advantage of all these things. So these are places where you're kind of seeing some very clear um, solidarity, right, across groups. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I think that that's very important too. Like that's a very important that needs, point that needs to be recognized and 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 understand that how that solidarity works and, and the the ideas that um, the experiences of different groups actually affect your group, right, and affect your your life. Um, so that's kind of what what this is getting at and what this research really wants to look at and. And right. I think the the call the the comment because yeah these are the kinds of ideas and thoughts that I w- I really want to hear about um, yeah. which is how people think about it you know and the different ways that people are conceiving these kinds of movements and these ideas of race ethnicity violence um, stress threats in communities and things like that. This, uh... <laughs> and, and, and what and what about what I I might I might sort of like. Uh, I guess take a different route because when it comes to immigration, you're talking about the federal officials, right? Um, not particularly community policing and all that good stuff. That's a whole different uh, umbrella when it comes to dealing with issues. That's a different type of policy that, you know, we cannot connect them because, you know, uh, the federal government, um, we, it, it's, it's not like we have... Um, and I don't want to miss say or misquote anything. Uh, you know, um, federal, federal, federal agents uh, storming. You know, uh, Crotona Park, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or federal agents uh, storming Getty from the parties because we're playing punta and we're having a good time. That's a whole different <laughs> notion. But yes, wow. it, 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 it is. It is. It is. It is. It's. It's. It's worth looking at it, but we have to know how to separate and just focus on what's at, at what's at what's at stake. What's at stake is right. that you know within the inner city neighborhoods, local police departments um, have been targeting um, local community members through uh, practices such as stop and frisk, and eventually build the case on inner city neighborhoods and all that good stuff. So we have to know how to sort of like make sure that we have a stark difference between that, between that um, with the federal government. The federal government is a, it's a whole different umbrella that even though we will want to go ahead and attach it, um, it's, it, 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 when I look at it, it's going to be sort of like difficult because, you know, where within the federal government are you going to identify a department that is targeting um, inner city neighborhoods and all that good stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I th- I think though that there may, there is a difference depending on where you are because again, if you're in Tucson, Arizona, um, and you're see this is this is also brings up some other interesting things about racial profiling <laughs> and, and right. the kinds of things you know. If you are the police, who do you think is Latino, right? And who do you think right. is black? And right. so there's these. Right. Again, the way we look at race here in the U.S. But if you live in Tucson, the police is the federal. <laughs> Basically, they function as immigration, right? So they're going right. to stop you right. because you supposedly right. look Latino. And they will stop you, and then you'll be deported um, if That's you don't right. have documents on you. So, so there's sometimes it gets a little slippery with with um, the definition of kind of who's who's federal, who's kind of community police, um, and it really depends on the how it's been politicized in a specific area. Um, and also, you know, also these these issues of, again, race, because um, in Arizona, the, the they will target what they believe looks like a Latino, whatever that means, that's right? right? That's right. Um, and that's so right. that's kind of another thing to address here is, is, um, is the way Latino communities have been racialized in the U.S. and what we've been told... You know, well, this yeah. is what it looks like, and that's it. And, I and have, otherwise, you're not Latino. I have a comment. So, uh, and, and FYI, Jerry, FYI Jerry. to the listeners, FYI to the listeners, it's not just the state of Arizona, but you also have to look at the immigration, local immigration law in uh, the state of Alabama, and I believe the state of Georgia, mm-hmm. those three states right. that you have to look at if you live within those states. Um, right. I remember taking a drive to, to, to Florida, and normally you see the... Uh, the uh, the crown, the the gray, it's 
crux, but you know, there are places in Florida, between Florida, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, where you see the, uh, um, I think it's the uh, immigration services trucks along uh, mm -hmm. I-95. I'm just saying. Right. Jerry, right. Tucker, let me take the opportunity to read another comment uh, that came from yes, Yolanda sir. Savio. She is listening here in Southern California. And she says, Black lives matter to me. I am a Garifuna woman. My ethnicity is Garifuna. My race is black. I am of African descent. So to me, black lives matter. Regarding the census, I indicate Garifuna. Specifically to bring attention to us as people. To do otherwise would not be able to be true to myself of who I am. I believe in self-determination, and this is one way for me to assert that. That's yep. Yolanda Savio. Mm -hmm. There is another uh, comment that came in right now via uh, Garifuna Language and Culture Academy page. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is Garifuna Music and Talk with DJ Labuga, your weekly uh, radio show on lmbroots.com radio and www.radiocentralamerica.com. So we're live uh, around the world. So this is the comment that came in. Uh, the second comment, actually the third comment, I think that uh, the speaker is overreaching to try to establish, link, or lump all of us into this campaign. I repeat, black lives matter. I agree. However, if we are discussing Garinagu, who are not native to the United States, then I think that we need to discuss this, um, um, how the system affects all of us as Garinagu in a rather discriminatory way. No one is denying the issues of black people that black people uh, face. In America, of course, I am simply taking the issue with trying to lump Garinagu into the Black Lives Matter campaign. Thank you. Right. I, I would, just to respond to that, um, that is, I, Maybe there was some miscommunication, but that is exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Right. <laughs> I, I right. want to right. really understand um, the, how this movement is perceived among the community. So if if there's some resonance with Black Lives Matter, uh, that's something that I think is important to understand. And if there isn't, then I think that's also important to understand. Right. But um, But in no way is there an attempt to you know, say everybody needs to either, you know, be 100% behind this movement or not for this movement, or I really want to understand the intricacies and, and the complexity that's going on there, because it, it is a, it is complex, right? It's not as easy as one, two, three. There's very, a lot of things that are going to influence the way people feel and react um, towards a movement like this, uh, towards issues of police violence, towards being uh, a certain race in the U.S., how that also relates to Central America, how it relates to the home country, um, it gets it gets very complex. So, so I just want to make that clear that that really what I want to do is have those conversations. Um, and if I can use the word de lump, right, <laughs> like break it <laughs> apart to really yes. understand all those differences, I think that that those that's very important. Yes. Um, uh, and just FYI, there is a hybrid, uh, a Garifuna hybrid of Black Lives Matter called Garifuna Lives Matter, which is the group or concept that was created about three, two, three years ago by Mr. Pablo Blanco in, in New York. And it's the same concept, sort of like, you know, taking away or just adding a Garifuna presence to the movement and stuff. Uh, and I specifically mm -hmm. remember that it, he was pushing for such a thing to have these conversations because, yes, uh, again, when it comes to community policing, whether you're in the south side of Chicago, whether you're in south central L.A., whether you're in New Orleans East, whether you're in South Bronx, whether in, in, you're in, uh, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, um, whether you are in Detroit, um, or whether you're Spokane, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. That perception, it, it's that perception. So I vividly remember that a couple of years ago, Pablo Blanco began such a concept uh, to sort of like, you know, intersect that into our community as well. I don't know how far it has gone, but 
that would be someone that, you know, uh, to get his perspective in terms of, like, how did this, this came about and what is the connection between Black Lives Matter and a hybrid of Get Even the Lives and the Black, Get the Lives Matter and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, that would be very important. All right, beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry and uh, Dr. Alvarez. Um, is there anything that uh, you would like to say? Um, you know, we don't we don't want to be hammering over the same issue over and over. And definitely, we want to make sure that uh, we give the opportunity for Dr. Alvarez to invite the community that is listening. There's a lot of people listening right now online, online, and to the point that uh, you know some people are complaining that the the um, connection is is bad that it's kind of hard to hear because it's just too many people tuning in online right now at this point so um why don't we give uh, dr alvarez the opportunity to invite some of the members of the community if they want to contact you uh how do they go about uh, getting in touch with you doctor to participate in this project in this study thank you yes um again my my fundamental intention is to really just hear from the community and so there's two components one is an interview and the other one is a survey the interview will take about uh, 30 minutes or so but I'm willing to listen as long as people want to talk um, it can be in either English Spanish um, those are the <laughs> languages that I'm fluent in um, and uh, and then the survey is much quicker it's actually an online survey so if people want to give me their information, I can very simply just send them the link and they can fill out the survey and pr press enter. It's all done through the internet. So um, to get a hold of me, um, if, if people want to participate in this research, and I really hope that the community would, would like to participate in it, uh, my contact information, Rani, I think I sent you um, in, in written form, and I don't know if it can be posted somewhere, but... Yes, yes, um, I will it, do that. My, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, my email is Linda dot Alvarez, so L I N D A dot A L V as in Victor A R E Z at CSUN dot edu, and I'll spell that out. CSUN is C as in cat, S as in Sam, U as in university, and N as in Nancy dot E. Like Edgar, D like dog, and U like university. Uh, so linda.alvarez at cson.edu, or they can uh, call me and um, uh, at the, the following number, which is 818-677-3818. Um, and uh, that's my number. If there's no answer, please leave a message, and I will definitely... Um, if you email me or call me, I will definitely get in touch with you and see if you'd like to um, be a part of the interview or if you'd like to do the survey or if you'd like to do both. Um, I will send you the information or schedule a time to be able to speak with you at length. So uh, that is my information. Can mm -hmm. you repeat the phone number, uh, please? 818. Yes. So the phone number is 818-677-3818. Three eight one eight. Okay. Yeah. And, this and is I would Adobe. say the. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the email is is a more direct connection, um, but just in case people do want to call the number, um, just leave a message. Sometimes you know the voicemails can be strange, but if you leave a message, I will definitely get back to you. Um, and then of course, email comes directly to me all the time, so I will. Um, definitely get back to anybody who contacts me and, and wants to participate. I would love to hear from as many members of the community as possible. Okay, great. So I am posting the information, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Garifuna Music on Talk with DJ Laboga. We have Dr. Linda Alvarez, who is an assistant professor at Cal State University Northridge, the only university in the United States with a Central American Studies program. And she is conducting research on Black Lives Matter. Uh, the information is being posted as we, as we speak right now. I have uh, a listener who has provided me with her email who would like to participate in this survey, uh, Dr. Alvarez. I will forward that email to you right away so that uh, you could communicate with uh, this listener, the East Coast, who is interested in participating in this study. Okay, great. 
Thank you so much. No problem. Jerry, anything you want to add, yes. brother? Well, I mean, uh, I commend the uh, Professor Alvarez for, you know, considering this topic. Uh, it's a very much needed topic uh, to be discussed within the community and stuff. Uh, and hopefully what would lead is it would lead to finding solutions or adding on to the solutions uh, of, uh, you know, improving um, community policing and stuff. Um, yes, mm -hmm. there has been a lot of uh, a lot of inroads, uh, but uh, as my grandfather used to say, the more the merrier. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, this is this is great, and I hope that folks uh, uh, will take it in lightly and uh, consider it. Uh, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, fifteen years ago, I was uh, doing a whole bunch of things and all that good stuff. Uh, I'm a dad now, and uh, you know, I I think of my son, my sons. Um, and how would this, you know, um, as a parent, you have a different um, perspective. And because uh, this has become a very constant thing, um, you know, it is very uh, sort of like painful, right, uh, mm -hmm. to see the President of the United States, you know, give an address about yet another incident. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And right. the more it has happened, you know, the more I'm, I'm you know, uh, it, it, the more you're like, man, you know, uh, what's going to end up happening tomorrow? You know what I mean? So always right. lift up that and all that good stuff. So hopefully this is going to lead to those kind of things and all that good stuff to ensure that, you know, folks have a perspective and uh, participation in, uh, in more solutions and stuff. Um, and uh, and just to kind of like change notes, um, uh, I know Ronnie, you probably have done it, but you know, uh, deepest condolences to uh, Raul Abuquicelio. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, uh, in Honduras, um, uh, uh, a man of many visions, uh, a man of many visions, uh, many approaches, uh, but he was a proud man despite of how many uh, of us. Uh, may have disagreed, but clearly a very well respected man within the community and all that good stuff. And uh, hopefully his legacy is going to lead people on and then, you know, learn from his achievements and successes and apply it to what it is that we're trying to accomplish and all that good stuff. And last but not least, someone mentioned about the, uh, about the census, about, I think it was Miss, uh, um, Cabo City, uh, Woody Thorpe from LA, uh, Ronnie. Um, um. Uh, the lady, no, the lady from from Southern California who spoke about the census and all that good stuff. Mm, not, don't remember exactly. Yes. she uh, the caller who made the comment about uh, uh, made a comment about Black Lives uh, Matter and, and oh, okay. she intentionally put Garifuna to bring attention to to the community. Right, right. That's the list Yolanda, from the East Coast. Think, Yolanda, Sabio. Yolanda Sabio. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, so, um, over the last couple of years, there's been many efforts to include uh, something close to have Garifuna on the census, right? Um, so, in 2014, I believe, there, is a, there was a group that met uh, with the uh, census group in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, and made recommendations as to, you know, what would come out in 2020, right? That's the next census, four years from now. Mm -hmm. Get ready, guys. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. In 2010, each and every one of us had to write in at in previous censuses, you know, what identity you want to be in and all like that stuff, right? Um, every year, the Institute of Caribbean Studies uh, Carib ID has been pushing to have, and uh, you know, not only uh, the identities of Afro-Caribbean, Indo-Caribbean, uh, mm -hmm. West Indian Caribbean, uh, but I know that this, uh, in 2014, uh, the term of Afro-Latino was recommended to the U.S. Census and all that good stuff. Uh, so nine times out of ten, depending on how things are going, uh, depending on how pushes has been going, um, this will lead to that kind of uh, uh, identity and all that good stuff. Um, I know that there's been efforts throughout the years uh, to ensure that Garifuna uh, get that visibility in in the census. Um, e 
even if there is not an official thing going on, I know always make sure that you participate. And so as someone who has been involved in politics, I'm always uh, um, encouraging folks uh, not only to get involved with the city council members, but the person who uh, votes on what kind of money is going to come to your congressional district is your congressman. You know what I mean? Uh, okay. So uh, uh, you have 27 congressional districts throughout the country where you have Garifuna populations predominantly and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and until our community come out in those districts, those Congress members are not going to know that there are Garifunas living in their districts and all that good stuff. So we need to come out. We need to get civically engaged. We need to participate because the more we're away from things, the more we're going to keep writing rather than checking our identity on that paper. Right. Wow, good point. Good point, Jerry. Very nice. Well, I want to thank you both of our guests tonight, uh, Dr. Linda Alvarez. Uh, there is a lot of response from the community. I would like to invite each and every one of you who are listening tonight to participate in this survey conducted survey. by Dr. Linda Alvarez in this uh, important aspect of uh, because the Garifuna community is being uh, taken into account. There's a phone number where she could be reached at 818-677-3818, also via email at linda.alvarez at season.edu. That is linda, L-I-N-D-A dot Alvarez, A-L-V-A-R-E-Z at season, Cal, Cal, State, Cal State University, Northridge, that edu. Of course, um, we are live and direct from the studios in Long Beach tonight, and I want to thank you again for taking the time to listen to our uh, guests tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez. Um, the microphone is yours, and Jerry, you will be next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Remy, for having me tonight, and uh, Jerry also for joining and offering your insightful comments. Uh, I think it's all very helpful, and also to all the members of the community that are listening tonight. I really appreciate um, being able to speak with everyone tonight, so thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for being here uh, with us tonight. Uh, Jerry? Well, likewise, man. I mean, it's an important survey uh, for us to participate in. As I mentioned before, it's a process to be part of the solutions as to how to improve relationships, and not only that, but uh, how to come up with solutions with policing and all that good stuff. So, yes, definitely not only would I, would I encourage folks, but, yeah, I'm going to sign on, too, uh, uh, based on the experiences that I've had both as an activist and as a, uh, personally when it comes to dealing with um, community policing. Right. Thank you so much. And you know what? There was another comment that came in just right now as we were uh, saying goodbye. Uh, do you have a minute to listen to it? Maybe we could just, uh, um, you know, it's. I think it's very important. Uh, this is from Sharon S.K. Williams. She is a immigration lawyer in, the, oh, yeah. in Northern California. And she says, yeah. this idea that Garinagu are not native to the U.S. is erroneous. I am a Garifuna. I was born outside the United States, therefore I am not native to this country. Nevertheless, my children are Garifuna and they were born in the United States. They are native to the U.S. They are both Garifuna and African American. For immigrants of African descent, which we are, our children who are born here are first generation Americans, are African American, or at least Many of them that I know identify as such. My point is that our, Im our immigrant values typically are lost within a generation and our children will be less likely to identify as from our countries than uh, as African Americans. With all that said, whether we so I identify or not, the rest of the country identifies us that, that way, which is why Black Lives Matter movement should mean something to us. We are black people. We are people of African descent. And the justice issues that affect the African Americans will also affect us and other immigrants of African descent. Thank you, Sharon, for that comment. What do you guys think about that? 
think I I agree one hundred percent. I um I think that's very true and it brings up a lot of again very um interesting points about how people identify um you, you know based on generation based on uh, you know the way pe- when when you ask somebody to identify themselves there's a, a a number of different categories that people will choose and so to make these categories you know because we're obsessed with categorization, but to, to, to discuss the, the way people view themselves, I think is very important and the way people identify. And so what she is saying, um, here, you know, even we, we touched on very slightly earlier on, but, um, when she mentions immigrant values typically are lost within a generation and our children will be less likely to identify as from our countries than as, uh, African Americans, um, Yes, that's that's kind of one of the things that I I would really like to understand um, and and hear more about um, because some of these things will resonate in different ways with different members of the community. So I I absolutely agree. I think it's very important to get these perspectives. Thank you. Jerry? Right. I mean, uh, Sharon has uh, her points in regards to that and just echoing back to what... um, Dr. Alvarez, Professor Alvarez, sorry, uh, it's saying, um, uh, I mean, right on point, uh, it's, it's, when you come across this thing, you're gonna, uh, discover, uh, you know, different lands on what the pride people have. You know what I mean? I've always said that I'm a very proud Garifuna American. There's no ands or ifs about it. Correct. That doesn't limit my participation, support, encouragement, and push to ensure that not only justice is served for Garinavu, but for everyone as a whole and stuff. Um, so, you know, and just like you're going to have um, other communities that are very proud of their ethnicity and stuff and would not have no quarrels in lending the hand to ensure that justice is served, where justice is not being served and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, but yeah, I mean, we're going to touch on many islands uh, when it comes to that. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, justice is justice. Regardless of who you are, what you are, justice is justice. You know, uh, violence is violence regardless of who you are. Mm-hmm. And uh, until it's not, it's, it's not eradicated, it grows, and we're not doing anything about it, regardless of who we, who we are as humans, um, it's just going to keep continuing all that stuff. Well, thank you so much. Uh, doctor, anything else? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, I mean, just again, thank you very much for sharing appreciate important it. insights from within the community with me. I, I appreciate it very much, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing more. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to call in or text. I don't know if that phone that will take text, but you can also write an email to Dr. Linda Alvarez to uh, make sure you participate in this survey. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, and, uh, of course, we will continue with more music tonight. Uh, Ayo, Jerry, thank you so much. I will talk to you soon. And thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez, for participating in our interview tonight. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.